Welcome into the Gig'em 24-7 Sports Podcast. I am Andrew Hattersley, joined as always by Brian Peroni. Uh, Brian, we've got an offensive coordinator to discuss, and, and we will certainly get into that. How's, how's everything been going? Oh, it's good. I, we also have more to discuss. You know, I logged on this morning, uh, you know, before we went on the air and saw you, dude. Uh, you look, uh, like, way different. Way different I than know. I think I've we ever ca- known you. You've always had kinda, long hair. I know. We kind of went with the – you know, I think everybody was kind of jarred and, and shocked when they saw my hair. I'm like, no, it went from being so long to, to short. I think it was just going to be jarring for, for anybody. But, you know, a couple of people were like, whoa, what happened to your hair? I know. <laughs> got, a, got a haircut. That's, that, that's, that's the simple extent of what happened. At least you've got options, man. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have much there to... You're not going to see my long, flowing locks anytime. I think I think anymore. that what everybody doesn't know is you just go for a haircut every week. You're just well, like, I do it. I do it. I do it myself now. I do, but <laughs> you know, I, I even when I do it no guard, I don't just shave the forehead. Though I got you know, <laughs> just go real high up there. I thought it looks good. No, they um, they 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 um. They did a good job. They did, you know, kind of did the little, the, the little razor, and and it was time. It was it was needed. It was getting a little bit, a little bit out of control. And um, you know, while I was while I was there, I and got a commitment from from Raymond Cottrell. So, you know, maybe I should go for for a haircut more often. Oh yeah, do it for sure. And yeah, Raymond Cottrell, he's a good player. Nice little surprise at a position of need for sure. No doubt, no doubt. And we will we will certainly discuss him that that happened after uh, we recorded last week but starting with Bobby Petrino that was the big news of the week happened actually while I was down at the All-American Bowl um, so I had a chance to catch up with Ruben Owens and Colton Thomason about that um, which is up on the on the site your your reactions to to that news all right so it was going to be hard for A&M to really find you know an offense coordinator that fans were going to be excited about i mean yeah right now anim's coming off a five and seven season you know jimbo fisher's embattled for sure you know fans have been clamoring for the buyout and things like that so i mean to be honest everybody wanted garrett riley right from tcu who's in the national yeah. championship game I mean, just i mean put yourself in his position you know he's getting you know lots of opportunities um uh, you know he'll likely be a head coach soon so you know, why make that jump? Yeah, money is going to be better at AM than other places. But, you know, there's – other than that, and he's already making good money and will make it as a head coach. You know, is there really anything for him to gain by making the jump to AM, especially when people are concerned about Jimbo Fisher and, and play calling? You know, are you really going to get all the autonomy that, that you want? So, you know, Petrino, I, I think people didn't really think it was the sexiest guy. But – you know, I've, I've talked to a couple of people that, you know, familiar with the industry that, did, that know him and everything. And, you know, it, it seems to be consensus that it's actually a good fit. You know, he's not, you know, I, we had reported on the day of that, uh, you know, originally Fisher and, and Petrino didn't come to, you know, didn't see eye to eye with the role, you know, with, with how much autonomy he would be given. You know, that changed. And, you know, some people said, you know, he will, you know, stand up to Jimbo if Jimbo tries to, you know, sort of undercut him at all. And also, I mean, his offenses have been pretty good. So, you know, it's not the young up-and-comer that people are in love with, but he's also not a guy that's, you know, looking, you know, to jump to a head coaching job or anything like that if things go well. So, um, I mean, is it, you know, is it a splash? No. Um, you know, could it go wrong? Yeah. But I don't think it's, you know, it's anything terrible. And I think there's a chance that his offense could be pretty good. I mean, Arkansas fans are really worried about A&M now, and that should – you know, tell you something, you know, people that are really familiar with him, you know, from his time at Arkansas, and they seem worried. And, shoot, he almost beat Arkansas this year um, at uh, Missouri State. Missouri, Missouri State, State. State, yes. Oh. Now, and, you know, and added bonus, you know, hiring away from, from UNLV, UNLV <laughs> went out and, and plugged – uh, Texas wide receivers coach Brennan yeah. Marion. So it kind of, kind of, kind of hurt. Yeah, we were talking about that. Texas, Texas fans process. were laughing. Yeah, Texas yeah. fans were laughing at A and M because oh, they had to go back on their, you know, go back and get a guy that would reject them or whatever, and then get the little domino effect. They lose their their wide receiver coach at UNLV. <laughs> and like oh, they were shouldn't have laughed and hoped yeah. that would happen. Not 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 such a laughing matter now. And yeah. You know, I I think your your point that you brought up is a good one, and I I kind of feel the same way. Look, there's there's no guarantee 
And and there's no surefire hire, I don't think, that was out there. I think every guy would have come with some risk. That's just the nature of this. So, you know, to say Bobby Petrino comes with some risk, he does. But what other offensive coordinator hire wouldn't have come with some risk? If you, you know, we we heard all the names on the on the list. Phil Longo. Phil Longo struggled towards the end of his season at North Carolina. And I think there was some folks around North Carolina that were ready for him to to probably move on you know they were there were other guys that you know there were there were other names that that folks kind of latched on to and and everybody would have come but i th- i think your point is a good one that bobby petrino is going to be a guy that's not going to be afraid to stand up to jimbo fisher if he tries to kind of get too involved or or try to dictate things and i think honestly i think the discussion about the role and 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 the play calling duties was was a good example of that that's in a kind of an indication of a of a spot where bobby petrino can say look this is where this is where i stand this is this is what i believe in and and can kind of be someone that can stand up to jimbo fisher and and the reaction i got talking to folks around san antonio and and you and i have certainly talked about this before is it 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 frees Jimbo Fisher up to worry about other aspects of the program recruiting for one. And, you know, that's, that's something that when you, when you talk about Bobby Petrino, that's a piece of feedback truthfully that we've heard is he doesn't love recruiting. He's not a, he's not a guy that's going to, you know, mingle and schmooze with a bunch of recruits and, and just doesn't love that part of the job. And, and that could also be an indication as to why he had a drop off in the later years of his, of his, uh, time at Louisville and, and elsewhere is because he doesn't love to recruit. Now I think he's going to have the most talent he's ever had the, the the chance to work with, with guys like Evan Stewart, with Connor Wigman, with Moose Muhammad. I think he's going to have the most talent that is disposable to, that he's, he's really had the chance to work with. So I think it's got a chance to work. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously got some risk. It's going to be fascinating to be in that, you know, to be a fly on the wall in that, offensive room with with him and and Jimbo Fisher discussing game plans and things like that they're going to have their oh, yeah. disagreements <laughs> um, but you know but there's there's a, there's a lot of experience there too with those there's two, a lot of experience you know, bouncing things off each other and I think to expect that Jimbo Fisher was going to go out and get like an air raid guy or somebody like that that just wasn't going to be the case he was going to get somebody that matches his philosophy for the most part I think that was reasonable to expect in many ways, Bobby Petrino kind of fits that. And so, you know, you, you have a ton of experience. You free Jimbo Fisher up to worry about other aspects of the program. I think it, I think it could end up being a positive. We'll find out this fall. And anybody who says it was, is a failure or home run hire, you know, you're just guessing at this point. We'll find out in, in middle of the season where, where things are with, with this with this program and, and, and it's a huge hire for a and It's, there's a lot riding on it. Oh no, for sure. And like you said, yeah, you can't, nobody can put a verdict in yet. I mean, a lot of times you can with coaches and with, yeah, even, even with coordinators, you can do that, but yeah, this one won't be known. So anybody that's just completely bashing it, I mean, off base, anybody that's like, Oh, this is the best ever, you know, off base, you know, you have to, you have to see how he does. I mean, it's been a while since, since he was a coordinator. I mean, it's been actually a long time since he was a coordinator, unless you count the week at, at UNLV prior to. <laughs> hey man, he's, been, he's, been a, he's been an offensive coordinator in two schools in the past month. <laughs> no, yeah, you're right. He does. Forget about the experience there. You know, yeah, it's been a while since he hasn't been the man in charge. So, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen? You know, maybe his, maybe he clashes with Jimbo or maybe it works out you know, seamlessly, uh, you know, who knows, but it's one of those things where it's not, yeah, it's not an immediate, just yeah, failure. So, you know, give it time, see what happens. I think this spring, you know, could be fun to watch with, uh, you know, maybe some new wrinkles in the offense. Who knows? Maybe, maybe he and Jimbo just get into a, an agreement and everything looks the same, you know, that that's not yeah. ideal, but you know, we'll find out a lot in the spring. And then especially, like you said, yeah, the beginning of the year. If nothing else, it's going to be an intriguing. That's, that's for, for sure, one way or another, it's going to be it's going to be fascinating to watch how this all works out. Another big addition, like we talked about, is on that offensive side of the ball was Raymond Cottrell. Um, and you know this this was this one was kind of a one that happened quietly behind the scenes. He's taken multiple visits to Texas A&M. He took an official visit over the summer. He came back for a game during the fall. 
probably an indication when he didn't sign with Georgia during the early signing period that, that uh, you know, he was at least open to his options. Florida had been pursuing him as, as well, but for A&M, you, you now have two four-star receivers in the class. I'm not sure in November, you know, there was a question about if A&M was even going to sign a skilled player, not, not from us, but <laughs> around, around yeah. the rest of the market. Um, and, and now a and sitting with two four-star receivers in the class. And, um, you know, I think, I, th- I think a pretty good one and, 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 uh, a pretty good find late in the cycle. Oh no, for sure. I mean, he, uh, yeah, he was assigned to Georgia. He was planning to, I mean, he was committed. Georgia was planning to enroll early, um, you know, and then just decided, you know, Georgia did get the two, uh, you know, mm-hmm. the two top wide receiver transfers in the portal. And obviously their class is really good. They're playing a national championship game and favored, um, you know, so I think maybe he, he saw some writing on the wall there about playing time, but, that doesn't mean a ton. I mean, he's still uh, really good. It's like, you know, kids transfer from Ohio State receivers and, you know, end up still a stud. You know, Jamison uh, Williams to, you know, to Alabama. Um, you know, it's absolutely loaded. So, you know, I don't think, you know, if there was, you know, if Georgia did, you know, maybe encourage him to look around or, or wasn't showing him as much love, it doesn't matter. I mean, he's ranked, what, in the top 150 in the country. Uh, yeah. Big kid, you know, pretty fast. And, you know, he isn't signed yet. I think, you know, fans that are listening that haven't been on the boards, just he did say, you know, I'm officially signed with AM. He signed his scholarship paper. So that binds AM to him. So AM, you know, no matter what, if AM decides, oh, we don't like this guy, they're they're bound to him for at least a year with the scholarship papers. It doesn't bind him to AM. Uh the thing that binds him now, since he didn't sign during that, the period only lasted what from the twentieth to the twenty second. Correct. Um yeah, so so since he didn't sign, and then the, the, what what makes him bound a and now is when he shows up for class. First day of class is on uh, January seventeenth. So uh, I don't, we don't expect any kind of hiccups or anything there. But just uh, you know, just a note because a lot of people are wondering like, how come how come you guys aren't saying he's signed? Because he's not technically you know signed in the right. in a sense. But yeah, he, I mean, he's a guy they need. You know, if nothing else, they need body as a receiver. But he's more than a body. He's a big guy. They're looking for a big guy, um, you know, Marquise Montgomery, uh, Juco kid. You know, they offered him because they were looking for that that bigger receiver. So, uh, receiver is still, you know, a need in the in the portal. But yeah, this, you know, if you think uh, Cottrell can come in and, and play right away, you know, even if it's just his depth, then you know, it alleviates some of those concerns. No doubt, we've got a lot of questions you and I on the on the board over the past couple of weeks about well, who's A and M going to target as an outside receiver well one they got Noah Thomas there and they feel pretty good about Noah Thomas and and they could look at Cottrell as a guy that can come in like he said as a as a depth piece as a guy that contribute I still think there's a need and and obviously Marquise Montgomery is a guy that they have have offered Joshua Cobbs is still out there he also has an offer and, and hasn't committed yet um, Grant to both somebody did ask about him on the board he did end up returning to Charlotte and then declaring for the NFL draft yeah. this weekend. So he is now off the table. Um, he was a guy that AM was connected to early on in the, the portal cycle. But, you know, they still they still have um, probably a need at adding size at that at that outside receiver position. But, you know, you mentioned it with a guy like Cottrell, 6'2", 203, and, um, you know, was, was a really good player in high school. He's ranked as the number 24. 24 receiver in the 2023 class and uh you know to to have him and and Micah Tease in the fold is a pretty solid receiver class all things considered with some of the the receiver struggles on the on the you know this past season or not receiver but offensive struggles overall yeah obviously you would love to have Hakeem Williams and Jalen Brown and all those guys but I think A&M did pretty well overall to get those those two in the class and um, can now look to maybe supplement that in in the transfer portal, but you know A and M does have Evan Stewart and Ann Moose Muhammad coming back, so um, you know they've they've got their top two options at least at least in the fold as well. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna look a little more at um, the twenty twenty three season that A and M offense and and talk a little more about Bobby Petrino right after a quick break.
Welcome back into the Gigam 24-7 Sports Podcast. I am Andrew Hattersley, joined by Brian Peroni. Brian, we're going to play a little buy or sell to, to close out the show today, a little new segment on the show um, with three questions. Uh, first, with the... the well, I, I want to point out, baby. I don't know the questions. You don't know the so, questions. Yeah, this, this, get, you know, you're going to get, get real any reactions. Facial expressions, yeah, any any real yeah. reactions. Uh, yeah, Brian does not know the questions. I've 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 come up with them. So, um, <clears throat> starting out, Brian, uh, with Bobby Petrino calling the plays, and I I think it's important to know with Connor Wigman back, Evan Stewart, Moose Muhammad, that all kind of comes into the picture as well. Does A and M average thirty points per game next season? Thirty. What, hold on, what which they average this season? A, which would be a, um, which would be a seven point jump from last season, and would put them right about middle of the pack. Would put them around ninth to seventh in the SEC this past season. I don't know. You got New Mexico, Miami, ULM. They should have no problem putting up points on any of those Auburn points. You know what? Yes, uh, ACU. Uh, SEC, okay, the schedule stuff, A&M has Alabama always, LSU always, um, you know, game at Tennessee. Tennessee looked scary even without uh, Hinden Hooker in that, in that bowl game. But other than that, not a ton of, uh, you know, SEC is, is probably going to be down a little bit, uh, at least yeah. SEC West, going to be down a little bit. So I'd say so because you also have, you know, Wigman coming back with experience. You know, he's going to have a whole spring under his belt as the starter. Uh, Evan Stewart with experience. Running backs, a concern. Um, you know, Ruben Owens, it's, that's a big jump to be the guy. Um, you know, is is he the guy the first game? Or is it Amari Daniels? Who knows? But uh, I'd say fact or fiction, true or false. What do we call it? It's buy or sell. Buy or sell. Buy or sell. Okay, I'll, I'll buy it. I'll say 30, 30 points. I, man, offenses score a lot. I would not have guessed that that would have just – been midway in the in the SEC. No doubt, it's it's kind of a jarring number until you you kind of look at it and you're like, man, Tennessee averaged forty six point one points per game last season. Now, oh yeah, I mean, points. come on, they're and, ridiculous. But but going down, you know, Georgia thirty nine, and then you had a whole bunch of teams in kind of the mid mid thirties. To your point, like that's you know that's that's kind of the jump A and M's looking to make. Obviously, A and M was down there at at. 22.8 points per game, 13th in the SEC, only ahead of Kentucky. Even even Vanderbilt averaged more than AM last season, which is, is kind of real bad to think about. Um, I'm with you. I think and it's got as much to do, and I and Tarp has made this point the past couple of days on the board with it's got as much to do with Connor Wigman coming back and Evan Stewart and Moose Muhammad um, as I think it does have in Bobby Petrino calling the plays. Now it's a yeah. fresh look. It's it's first advice. Let's not forget about Donovan Green. You know, A&M had to replace Jalen Widemeyer last season. Probably took a little bit for that tight end room to to kind of get going. But I think Donovan Green's kind of an exciting piece there. And, yes, A&M's going to have to figure out running back. Um, I think Amari Daniels, obviously, is, is kind of ready to to take over there as well as Lamion Moss and, um, along with, with Ruben Owens, which brings me to my next one. Um, AM has had a thousand yard rush for each of the last three seasons. Does that streak continue in 2023 with Amari Daniels, Le'Veon Moss, or Ruben Owens? Any one of the three that you see could potentially become a thousand yard rusher? I'm going to say no. Uh, not because I think the running offense struggles, because I think that for the first time under Jimbo Fisher, we will see more of a platoon. It's not going to be, I mean, there just isn't the obvious guy to go out there and carry. Yeah. 30 times a game. I don't think you throw a true freshman out there that much. And, you know, and I, they, you know, Moss struggled, you know, in, in the little bit that he got, but it was clear they liked him. You know, Mario Daniels, you know, he's good. He's got the, uh, you know, A-chain, you know, sort of A-chain role, but, you know, he's not as fast and, you know, it's nobody's going to be, you know, Devon A-chain. So I'm going to say no um, because of, I'm going to sell that because of, uh, you know, the fact that I, I don't think, I just don't think there will be one guy get that many opportunities. Yeah, I I am going to go out on a little bit of a limb and say yes. I think Amari Daniels kind of showed that explosiveness late in the year that, you know, I think I think he could, you know, what we saw um, 
kind of late against Ole Miss I, or against Auburn is kind of where I think, um, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of got that explosiveness and I think potentially could be, could be that guy that can step in and uh, yeah, it, you know, it, it, it remains to be seen that does a and kind of split the carries. We've, we've seen a and kind of lean on one guy heavily. And I think until Jimbo Fisher kind of shows that he's going to change that, I think yeah. is the other is the other is the other aspect. Does he find a guy and just go with it? Um, I agree. I think Ruben Owens is going to be a guy that that contributes, but it's going to take some time. He's a high schooler coming up to the college level, um, and you know I do expect him to have an impact, but um, I think it could take some time. But I think Amari Daniels in this offense is going to be it's going to be really fascinating to watch, and I I think he could be kind of a breakout guy. Um, from that perspective. So going a bit out on a limb there and we'll see, I could be horribly wrong, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, and, and then with the, with the national championship coming up tonight, TCU is double digit underdogs against Georgia. Um, but we've already seen them pull off one surprise already beating Michigan. Do they keep it within a one score game against Georgia though? Georgia is kind of a different animal. They're 12 point underdogs. Do they keep it to a one score game? Yes. Um, I mean, TCU, what, their only loss this year is the Kansas State in overtime. Uh, they were down pretty big in the first half a number of times. I mean, they should have lost to Baylor. You know, they'd lose to Baylor in that same scenario, you know, 99 times out of 100. And, you know, they managed to come back. They have not been outplayed, you know, in any game or just dominantly outplayed. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think they keep it close. Uh, Georgia does have more to prepare for, seeing how TCU, you know, played against Michigan. But I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's hopeful too because of how good the semifinal games were. I mean, th- those two games yeah. that day were incredible. So it's like ah, that the the encore has to be even better. So it, it may be just hopeful. But yeah, I think I think they do keep it keep it within a score. I think there's a chance there's a chance they win, and this is going to be on old take exposed. When he's going to show the score, like Georgia fifty-five, TCU three, you have to be saying there's a chance they win. But no, I think there's a chance they pull it out. Yeah, being bold, I like it. It's that's what that's what the, that's what this is all about. Um, you know, I am going to go no. I think Georgia's too talented. Uh, obviously, everything that they've 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 kind of got offensively. Stetson Bennett, obviously Brock Bowers. I don't. I, I just don't see it. I think they probably end up winning this by, by 14. And, um, you know, they're just so, they're just so loaded and, you know, 10 TCU has been, been an awesome story and, and this could be a, an old takes exposed as well. But I, I think, I think George is a lot better built to be able to control the trenches than, you know, you look at what TCU did to Michigan, they just dominated the trenches um yeah. and you know i just i i just i just don't know if i see that happening on monday night and 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 probably see georgia uh being able to kind of establish their will there and uh you know one of the big concerns for me is is tcu going to be actually able to run the ball against georgia um with the guys that they have up front so i'm go- i'm going to go no on that one but at least at least we disagreed on a couple of them that's oh yeah that's at least uh, that that that's what we're going for right and um we will certainly be back next week to kind of take a look at the we've we've got a couple another week here on the the high school recruiting dead period and then um i think as we'll begin picking back up um with national signing day just a couple weeks away at this point a&m still has a little bit of work to do before national signing day a couple guys still out there as they look to kind of round out this class and we'll certainly be back to kind of break that down um as always if you you like the show be sure to hit like and share on on youtube to um to push this out and and uh, give us a five-star review on <laughs> apple apple and and spotify and until then enjoy the national championship game and and we'll see you guys soon <laughs>